All right. Uh, one second, let me minimize all my video here. Okay. So welcome everybody. I hope you all are having a fine evening tonight. Uh, my name is Christy Morley and I am the senior naturalist at Wissick and Trails. And we're gonna talk about nature photography tonight. So um, just wanna take a second to um, talk about who we are. Wissick and Trails is an environmental nonprofit based in Ambler, Pennsylvania. Um, we were founded a little over 60 years ago to protect the land and water um, of the upper Wissick and Creek in Montgomery County. Um, we have saved nearly 1,300 acres of land from development and on that land we have 12 nature preserves and about 24 miles of trails that are open for your enjoyment. Um, and I hope some of you um, have, you know, uh, taken part in some of the, the nature out there. Um, and if you haven't, I encourage you to go onto our website and take a look at our interactive map feature that will tell you all about the trails and preserves. Um, I will say we are still recovering from the tropical storm and we have still some damage in areas of trails, uh, the Green Ribbon Trail itself that are closed, but all of our preserves are open. Um, so you certainly can go walking there and maybe a good opportunity to check some out. Since we are a nonprofit organization, we rely um, very much on our supporters and to anyone who's on tonight who is a supporter of ours, I offer my uh, heartfelt appreciation and thanks. Um, we definitely depend on our supporters to carry out our mission. And if you're currently not a supporter, again, I encourage you to go look at our website and read about all the work that we're doing um, and hopefully become uh, encouraged to become a supporter of ours. Um, real quick, um, in case anybody missed the introduction screen and is joining late, um, I just would ask everybody to keep their uh, microphones on mute. Um, I'll be using the chat for questions, so please feel free to pull down the chat box on your screen and type your questions in. And you can type them in for everybody to see, that's fine. Um, and, and then uh, I will be stopping periodically to look at what questions there are and answer them, and then moving forward in the presentation. So I have about three or four stops for questions um, throughout the presentation, so feel free to use the chat box, and that's what I'll be checking for questions that people may have. So I wanted to start tonight with an outline and sort of some goals for you all um, that I hope that you can take away from this presentation tonight. Um, I am going to start talking about photography and nature photography from the technical aspect because it's really hard to talk about photography without talking about the technical side of things. But for those who are technophobes about photography, don't worry, I've tried to simplify this as much as possible um, and keep it very simple and straightforward. I only have four technical slides. Um, so, but hopefully that'll lay the foundation for you. And then what I'm gonna do is take you through a list of, of top 10 tips um, for better, photog better photographs. And we're gonna be speaking specifically about nature photography tonight, but a lot of the things that I'm gonna give you are gonna be good for any kind of photographs that you're taking. And hopefully you'll see how that carries over um, from nature into maybe you know a birthday party or something like that. Um, and then I'm, I'm gonna talk about mobile photography kind of scattered throughout as I go through the 10 tips. And I'm really gonna use those 10 tips as sort of the, the launching point to reinforce some of the te technical aspects that I introduced in the beginning. And then, but there are a few elements of mobile photography that are very specific to mobile. So I, I have a couple of slides on that um, towards the end where we're talking about that specifically. And then I'll end with um, some sort of typical settings that you might want to use as a starting point for some different types of nature photography. So I really have three goals for you tonight. Um, if you aren't doing this already, I want to try to convince you uh, to get your camera off of the fully automatic mode. Don't panic. I'm not going to tell you you have to shoot in manual mode. Um, there are a couple of other options that will still give you a lot of flexibility and a lot of control, but not have to go all the way to manual um, controls. If you're already doing that, great, that's wonderful. And I hope there's still some tips in here um, that you will take away from tonight for how to create better photographs. But I really want to challenge you to get your camera off the fully automatic mode. The other thing that I want to do is I want to challenge you to think about sort of creative compositions for your scenes um, and how to make the strongest composition that you can for what you're photographing. 
And then last but not least is I want to encourage you to enter a photo or two into our photo competition. And we're going to talk more about the photo competition at the end. Um, but just keep that in mind. I'd love for you to take uh, what you take here tonight away and actually apply it to some photography and enter it into our photo competition. Since we're all using different cameras and we aren't together and it's hard for me to see what cameras you have and it's difficult for me to tell you how to change settings exactly on your, your camera, um, I would do this even if we were in person, but I am definitely going to encourage you to read the manual that came with your camera. A lot of times we think, oh, I know how to take a picture. I turn the camera on, put a memory card in, I'm good to go. Um, but there's a lot of little things in that manual that if you don't dig deep, you may not find. And there may be some things that we talk about here tonight that are really, really helpful for your nature photography and building those skills. And so I encourage you to dig through that manual. I also encourage you to think about and look into and see if there's a third party guide. Um, there used to be a series of books called the Magic Lantern Guides um, to cameras and each individual camera had one and they were kind of an independent group of people. I don't really think they're doing it so much anymore, but there are still third party um, guides out there to your specific camera models. And I encourage you to take a look at them because oftentimes they have sort of even more in-depth information than your manual might have. So they're gonna go really deep into what all the menus are, where settings are, um, how to optimize things, uh, and those kinds of things. So I really encourage you to um, take a look at that. So with that, uh, dive in. And so basically when we talk about photography and the whole goal of photography really is to get a properly exposed image for viewing. And at its most basic level, this means having an image that isn't too light, so overexposed or too dark, underexposed. We want to go for that correct exposure. But exposure also means exposing creatively um, based on your subject matter. And because nature photography definitely lends itself to a lot of those sort of creative exposures, that's what we're really going to focus on tonight. We're going to talk about the um, you know, proper light exposure, uh, but mostly we're going to focus on that creative exposure kind of idea. So when you get ready to take a photograph and you turn on your camera, um, there's a couple of key decisions that you need to make. Actually, more than a couple. There's several key decisions you need to make. First and foremost, you need to decide what file format you're going to shoot in raw versus JPEG. And the short story for those who are not as familiar with this kind of concept is that raw images, when they're available to be used by your camera, and it's camera specific, um, a lot of cameras are able to shoot raw, even phones can shoot raw images now. Basically, they're bigger file sizes, there's much more data included in them, and they give you a lot more latitude when you're processing um, because you have more data to work with. Basically, there's a lot of things that we're going to talk about here in this list, like white balance and um, other things that we'll hit on later on, like sharpening and contrast, that um, you have complete control over when you're editing that image after you're done shooting for the day. When you shoot in JPEG, the downside to that is you absolutely have to edit raw images. And I have an example of that later in the presentation, so you'll see why that is. Um, if you're shooting with JPEG, you don't always have to edit. You can use the picture as it is. But the downside is, is that if you do need to edit, you have a lot less data to work with. And there's a lot of things that get we call baked into the photo, like co contrast and sharpness and white balance that you now can't change. And so you lose a lot of that flexibility. So um, JPEG is fine, just know that you need to be much more conscious of the settings that you're choosing and making sure that you're uh, properly exposing for the light and the subject matter at the same time, because it's gonna be more difficult to edit that. The next thing that you need to decide is what mode you're going to shoot in. Uh, I'm just going to run through these really quickly so everybody's familiar with what we're talking about here. So uh, this green um, box, sometimes on some cameras, it just says auto. 
that's always the fully completely automatic mode camera decides absolutely everything and it will automatically fire the flash if it's needed this p um, usually stands for program mode and that means there's a few adjustments that you can make but by and large the camera still does most things automatically the biggest difference is it won't fire the flash and so that can be useful when you're trying to take pictures of things that where you don't want that flash to go off and oftentimes when you're say you're photographing your kid's birthday party in the backyard and you're trying to get a lot of family shots and you know you're not worried about photo competitions you just want images that you might be able to share with family or on social media excuse me, oftentimes using the P mode in that case is absolutely perfectly acceptable and a really good choice because then you don't have to spend time thinking about uh, the images that you're making. You can just be working to try to snap the action as it's happening. And that may work just fine. Um, but you'll see later on as I go through this why that's not necessarily the best mode to be in um, when you're shooting um, nature photography. TV or S, depending on the camera model, is time value or shutter speed. It's the same thing. Um, it, and most of the time, um, you can let the camera pick this automatically. We're going to talk about that and, and use but some very specific situations where you might want to have complete control over the shutter speed that you choose. Um, AV or just A stands for aperture value. Um, this is where you're probably going to spend most of your time when you're shooting nature photography and i'll have several examples going through this um, that show you why that's the case so this is probably the one that you need to become most familiar with the aperture mode of your camera and most of the time i'm going to suggest you can probably be in aperture mode um, and do uh, some really great nature photography M stands for manual and except in some very specific circumstances like shooting the Aurora Borealis or star trails at night. Um, most of the time, I'm, my philosophy is I don't really think you need to be in manual mode. If you're already using it and you're comfortable being there, great, keep doing it. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, but it does scare a lot of people. It does, especially people who got into photography um, more on the digital end, where the camera actually does make a lot of right decisions most of the time. So it's really easy to um, not understand how to set those, those modes. So um, again, if you're using it, wonderful. If you're not, um, concentrate here on the AV and the TV modes and, and focusing on your aperture and your shutter speed and that's going to get you mostly where you need to be. Um, some cameras have recall memory modes so you can actually store settings. So again, this is where reading the manual is really important. If your camera is able to store settings, my camera is able to store settings so I can have um, key choices already made for um, shooting birds in flight, for example and I can quickly switch over to those settings and everything's ready to go and move on. Not all cameras can do that. So again, you have to investigate your particular set of gear. Um, a lot of cameras now have video modes. I'm not gonna talk about video tonight, but know that it is available on a lot of your uh, cameras. There's also a lot of these what we call scene modes. So things like portrait, landscape, child, sports, close up, night portrait. Um, these kinds of things can be helpful if you don't know sort of where to go in terms of setting things up. And these guys are going to um, sort of optimize for certain things. So we'll talk about this as we go through, but like sports is gonna optimize for shutter speed so that you're trying to freeze action. Landscape is going to optimize for um, aperture. And so to try to get a deep depth of field. Portrait is gonna do sort of right in front of you, um, getting a blurred background. So they can be helpful um, to get started, but know that sometimes the, the more advanced features of your camera might not be available if you use these modes. Like in my camera, I can't shoot raw if I use these modes. It only shoots JPEG because it wants to have that control. So keep that in mind if you're using those um, scene modes. White balance is the next choice that you have to make. And what white balance does is controls the appearance of the color in your images. So this is, you know, the same picture behind here. And this is going to show you sort of what that image would look like if you picked either any one of these white balance choices. When you're shooting raw images, 
you generally can leave this on auto when you're outside and then play with it in post-processing if you want to. Um, the camera usually does a pretty good job. Most cameras th these days do a pretty good job of picking this out. Um, things that might fool it a little bit are when you're shooting in snow, and so you just need to be more aware of that. But again, there's a lot you can do in post-processing that's very easy um, that will help you fix that. If, however, you're shooting in JPEG, you absolutely have to get your white balance right when you shoot the pictures because it's attached to that photo, it's baked in, you can't change it. And um, it's much more apparent when you're inside and under artificial lights. I have an entire series of pictures um, inside from part of a vacation that the white balance was set wrong and I have yellow pictures and I can't do anything about it. So it is something that you need to be very careful of if you're shooting in JPEG and, and make sure that you're setting um, for the situations that you're in. And if you're outside, basically daylight, cloudy, and shade are really the ones that you wanna focus on. Daylight's gonna warm things up, make things more yellow, orangey kind of bring out those colors. Shade is gonna make things a little bit more blue. Um, so you just need to be aware of that. Um, metering mode. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because every camera is a little bit different, but just so that we're all coming from the same place. Essentially, metering mode is how the camera is judging the scene for areas of light and dark. And you you need to meter to, to create the proper exposure, um, but how your camera reads that scene is, is determined by the metering mode that you set. So here's a couple examples from Canon. All the major manufacturers have very similar kinds of things. They call them different names, um, but basically at the top, you're talking about the camera sort of taking an average of the whole scene to use to decide what the shutter speed and aperture should be. When you um, come way down here to the bottom or to spot metering, you're focusing on a very specific area of your image or your scene um, to take that reading. Again, every camera is a little different. Every camera is a little different in terms of how they respond to certain situations. Most of the time, this sort of evaluative metering or scene average metering is going to be perfectly acceptable. Um, but there are difficult things like backlit birds or really bright skies where you might want to know how to switch to one of these other metering modes and use that um, to help you set up your exposure. And it's one of those things that in your manual online, if you search your camera model and metering modes, you'll get loads of good resources um, for um, being able to understand how the individual modes for your camera work and how to change them. And the same is true for focus modes. Um, focusing kind of has two components. One is the mode you choose. So whether you're on automatic, whether you're on manual focus, whether you're doing continuous focusing um, across a moving subject. And again, every camera model is a little bit different how you set that and what the impact of that is. And then the other thing that you set for focus is the point that the camera is or points that the camera is using to focus so each camera model has a certain number of focus points built into it um, in this it's represented by all these little squares here on the screen and these are the primary focus points that you can pick in most current digital model cameras you can change which point you use to focus on you can change how many points it uses. And again, that's very camera specific. So I encourage you to um, do some searching online or read your manual, um, but something that will impact your ability to do things like birds in flight, for example. Um, that's where those kinds of things are gonna matter the most. So all of those things that we've talked about right now are going to give you our, our part of going into that exposure. Um, but when we talk about exposure, most of the time what we mean are these three things here, aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. So we're going to dive a little bit deeper into those. So aperture, shutter speed, and ISO make up what we call the exposure triangle. And it is a balancing act. And setting an exposure is always a compromise. There's give and take. 
and you have to decide what is the most important thing for your image. So to take the most control over. Let's walk through what these three things are um, and talk about them. So ISO is really about the sensitivity of the sensor in your camera. I'm presuming you're shooting digital. It's also the sensitivity of film to light. Um, in general, we always want to try to use the lowest ISO possible so that we reduce digital noise. So most of the time, if we're shooting in bright, sunny conditions, we have ISO down here at the bottom of the triangle and shooting down here in the 50, 100, 200 ISO, that's really great. Bright, sunshiny day, wonderful. Um, we start getting up into the 400 and 800 and here it really depends on the camera model. Um, some camera models nowadays, 400 and 800 are really fine. There's no digital noise or very little. Some older models, you start to see significant digital noise around 400 or 800. Um, you start getting into the much higher ISOs like 1600 or 6400 where you're shooting in really, really low light conditions and you'll start to see noise. Now, most of us didn't care about noise when we shot film because film always had noise in it. It's that areas of the photo that start to look a little speckled um, to our eye and not absolutely crisp. And somehow it never mattered when we shot film or it mattered much less. When we all started shooting digital, all of a sudden noise became absolutely the most horrible thing that you could have in your image. Um, and the reality is, is that sometimes you're gonna have to have noise. And there's going to be times when you're gonna have to let your ISO go high um, to a higher range like 800 or 1600 uh, in order to be able to get the shot if you're in a low light situation to be able to get uh, the, the image in focus, particularly if you're shooting animals or birds under tree cover. Um, but think of it this way, it's always better to have a sharply focused picture than it is to have a little bit of noise. And so if you need to let that ISO go a little bit higher so that you can focus and you can actually get the shot, then there are ways of dealing with the noise after the fact. But generally we wanna to try to keep this as low as possible. Shutter speed. Um, we talk about shutter speed in seconds, so we can have very small fractions of seconds. Um, one one thousandth of a, <laughs> yeah, one one thousandth of a second. Um, or we can have much longer shutter speeds, a half a second, one second, five seconds. Um, but this is the amount of time that light is allowed to come through your lens and hit your sensor. And most of the time, as we're going to talk about our 10 tips, you can probably let the camera select this value uh, because the vast majority of the time, unless you're shooting some very specific things, aperture is probably going to be what you're more interested in controlling. So if you set your ISO to 100 and then you choose your aperture, you can let your camera pick the shutter speed. One thing you do want to be aware of with shutter speed is... Um, all of us have sort of a limit at which we can safely handhold a camera without motion. And usually, and it's a little bit different for everybody, and it's a little bit different for every camera. So it's something that you're going to have to test for yourself. Um, and unfortunately, as we age, that sometimes changes. Um, we get a little bit less able to hold the camera completely still. So we have to have a faster shutter speed to compensate for our own motion so we don't capture that blur in our images. In general, the guideline is to not let your shutter speed go above the focal length of your lens. So for example, if you're shooting with a 400 millimeter telephoto lens, you don't want your shutter speed to drop below um, the closest shutter speed you can set to one four hundredth of a second. Usually it's one five hundredth of a second. So it gives you a little bit of a buffer. But if you're shooting um, a 50 millimeter lens, well, then you can go to one fiftieth of a second. And so you have some variability depending on the type of lens you're using. So keep that in mind. That is one area where you do want to pay attention to your shutter speed and make sure that the camera is not selecting something that's too slow for you to handhold. 
And lastly, aperture. Aperture is the size of the hole in your lens that the light passes through. And most of the time, as you'll see, this is what we wanna control when we're doing nature photography. And I'm gonna go to the next slide because aperture is often the most confusing thing to people. And so it's the, it's the one element of control you wanna use most of the time. I'm gonna spend a little bit more time on it. Um, so we said it's the hole in the lens that light comes through. And this is exactly, if you were looking down the barrel of your lens, sort of the cameras behind my computer, if you will, and this is the front of your lens. If you could see in there when the aperture is set, this is what you would see. There's actually blades inside your lens that form a circle. And it's, it is a, not exactly a circle, it does have lines. Um, and that can be helpful if you wanna create like a sunburst pattern, for example. You can use this to your advantage. But um, apertures are fractions. So smaller numbers like F2.8 are larger openings. F16 is a much, much smaller opening. F numbers are fixed based on the lens you're using. So you'll see a range of apertures listed like this, but your camera, your lens may not do all of these. Um, and usually where the limits are, are down at this wide open end. Most cameras can go F8, F11, F16, um, even a little bit narrower. The narrow end of the aperture range is not the problem. It's this end down here. This is what adds cost. This is what adds weight um, in order to make a lens that opens this wide inside. So a couple examples here. Um, manufacturers always label their lenses with the maximum aperture. So that's this wide open value. Um, if the camera is a fixed focal length, like the example I have here, this 50 millimeter lens, it's the only focal length of the lens, um, it'll have one number. So here's an example, F1.4. So even it'll go even wider than I have on this drawing here. Um, if you have a, a, a range of focal lengths in your lens, so the example here is this Canon 70 to 200 millimeter lens, um, it could have one number, which means that across this entire range, F2.8 is the widest that the aperture will open, or it could have a range of numbers. And this is actually much more common. Um, these kinds of lenses with one number are really expensive. Um, the range of lenses, so this Canon 100 to 400 millimeter lens has a range. So F4.5 to 5.6. So 4.5 is the, smallest at 100 millimeters is the f 4.5 is the biggest that the aperture will open but if i zoom all the way out to 400 millimeters i can only open to 5.6 so um where this matters depends on the kind of photography that you're doing if you are doing, um, and again, this is not to encourage anybody to go out and buy new gear, please don't. I would rather encourage you to spend some time working really, really um, deeply with the gear that you already have before you worry about plunking money down on some other kind of lens or body based on what I say here tonight. Um, please don't do that because you need to figure out what you really want to get out of your next purchase if you want to upgrade your equipment for some reason or change your equipment for some reason. And so the best way that you can do that is really spend a lot of time with whatever gear you have, learn the ins and outs of it, understand how the aperture works, understand how the other settings like um, focus mode and focusing points and all of those kinds of things impact your images because that's going to be the best way to figure this out. Um, but what I will say is that lenses that tend to be down here in this 1.4, 2.8, these are what we call fast lenses. They tend to be expensive. These are the kinds of things that um, sports photographers use. These are the kinds of things that wedding photographers who have to be inside of a dark, darker church or inside where they don't want to use flash um, or can't use flash in some cases, they need lenses that can open this wide. They can definitely be extraordinarily valuable for landscape photography. I mean, for wildlife photography, um, 
landscape photography, you're actually more out at this end here, the F11, F16. So again, something to keep in mind, but know that um, also when you have things represented, so you see here a capital F with no slash, uh, F small f with a slash and small f no slash, it, it's all the same thing. It's all referring to this F2.8. Just remember it's a fraction, smaller numbers, larger opening. So I've kind of alluded to this already, but what the aperture controls is the depth of field in your image. And what that means is that you have a couple of different ways to um, create focus. Obviously, we talked about focus points and focus modes, and those are really important. What this does, aperture is really like the zone of sharp focus. So think of it like a slice. So when you have something set down here at f2.8, this really, really big opening, you actually have a very narrow slice of focus, what we call a shallow depth of field. Everything in front of that slice and everything in back of that slice are not going to be in focus. And that can be really helpful if you're trying to do sort of wildlife portrait photography. It's also important if you're just doing people portrait photography as well. Oftentimes you want that blurry background, that shallow depth of field. On the other hand, if you have something set at like F16, remember this larger number gives us this really tiny opening, that gives us a very large depth of field. So it gives us a much wider slice of focus. So we get things in focus from the very front of our picture all the way to the back. And that becomes really important when we're doing landscape photography and we want a lot of things in focus um, and we want to be able to see all the way to the back of the image. We don't want that blurred background. Okay, take a breath. That is the worst of the technical side of things. Um, hopefully you all followed that. And throughout the 10 tips that I walk through, um, I'm gonna be showing you images that contain examples of things like depth of field and shutter speed and choices that I've made as I've taken these pictures that will hopefully um, help reinforce those um, ideas and, and let you see how to try to use that in your own photography. I'm gonna see if we have any questions here. And I'm not seeing any yet, and that's fine. Uh, that was a lot to lay on you. So um, please feel free to um, put questions in the chat box and I will take a stop at the next um, section and we'll go through them. So these are the 10 tips that I'm gonna go through tonight. Um, and this is you know, a list that, that I created sort of based on doing a lot of research for this presentation, thinking about my own photography, thinking about the things that matter when I'm out in the field trying to take photographs. Um, so we're gonna go through each one of these um, in a little bit more detail, pretty much with one slide, a few items have um, two slides. So um, just to sort of give you an idea about knowing your gear, knowing your subject, um, focal points, looking at working the light, um, all of those kinds of things are really important and, and how you set your camera up will um, impact how you can um, maximize some of these kinds of things. So I'm gonna dive in. So knowing your gear. First, I wanna start off by saying there's no good camera, there's no bad camera. Um, there's no right or wrong camera. They all have pros and cons and limitations. Some don't have um, very wide apertures. Some, you know, to get that wide aperture, they're really expensive and it's a trade-off. Um, so, but as I said before, you can learn to create great images with, with any gear once you understand the basics of, of exposure and how to use it. And just so that we're sort of all on the same page when I talk about this as we go through, um, when I talk about mobile things, I'm referring to smartphones. I use an iPhone, so I have a tendency to say iPhone. Um, Android phones do pretty much all the same things. Some things they actually do better than Apple iPhones do. Um, and they have a lot of the same functions and capabilities. So, um, and they are actually a perfectly adequate photographic option um, these days. So um, point and shoots, these guys are usually small cameras. Um, you can't change the lens. It has a zoom lens. Most of them have a zoom lens, but they're not very big zoom lenses. Um, and most of the recent models, I'll say, um, allow you to control pretty much all of the settings that we're shooting here tonight. There are some point and shoots that don't shoot raw. So if that's something that's important to you, um, you know, make sure that you're getting a, a point and shoot that is available, you know, raw is available. Um, but 
you know, for the most part, they're going to be able to do pretty much everything that we're talking about here tonight in terms of settings. Um, they just may be limited in some areas. DSLRs are kind of the, you know, high end um, complete camera system, I guess you could say. Um, these are interchangeable lens systems. So you have a body, you have a variety of lenses that you can use with it. Um, both lenses and bodies come in consumer and pro versions. So again, there are some features that may or may not be available to you depending on what you purchase. Excuse me, same with the lenses. A lot of what's sold as sort of consumer type lenses don't have those really fast apertures. So they might be f5.6 at their widest end, um, which can have implications for your photography. Again, doesn't mean you can't take good pictures with them. You absolutely can, but you need to understand the limitations um, that that brings. Um, oh, and then bridge cameras, um, these in the middle. There's a few different models of these. This is the Sony RX10 Mark IV. This is what I actually shoot right now. Um, I had a Canon system that I had two different bodies and four or five different lenses and Honestly, I got so tired of taking it around with me um, and not really using it properly because I had so much stuff. And most of the time when I'm out doing photography, it's when I'm out doing bird watching as well. So I've got binoculars and I've got other stuff that I'm worried about. So for me to now have this all-in-one system that has a powerful zoom lens and it's more powerful than the point and shoots and it has some high-end controls, this was like the perfect marriage. Um, it's a compromise. It doesn't reach quite as far and it doesn't quite shoot as sharply as um, the Canon big telephoto lens that I have, but it's a trade-off. I'm actually carrying it around and using it more now. So that's a good thing. Um, so again, that's kind of where you have to figure out what your uh, needs are um, and what you, what's the most important to you in terms of, of your photography. Um, optional gear. So this is, um, sorry, my notes are like way out of order here. Okay. Um, when optional gear, again, most of this stuff is really optional. Uh, memory cards are not, but filters, tripods, um, remote shutters, um, not really necessary for a lot of our nature photography, but if you're really into trying to shoot waterfalls and get a nice blurry motion, which we'll talk about how to do that, um, you're probably going to need all of these things. You're probably going to need filters, you're probably going to need a tripod, and you're probably going to need a remote shutter. And so um, that's the other kind of thing to think about as we do this. The other thing about knowing your gear is, you know, it comes back to reading the manual and knowing where the controls are, knowing what your menus are, knowing how to change settings on the fly. Um, the best piece of advice that somebody gave me was to actually sit at home and practice, put the camera up to your eye and have your camera up to your eye and actually practice moving your thumbs and your fingers and finding the buttons and knowing how to change things. How do I change my ISO really quickly? How do I change my focus point? Um, what are there buttons I can program that allow me to do certain things faster that I want to be able to do? And all of that's going to be in your manual, um, you know, in those online searches. And that is going to be the best way. Practice it until it becomes muscle memory. So you know how to change those things and you don't have to think about it when you're out there doing it. Um, second tip, know your subject. So particularly for wildlife and birds, just spend some time watching them uh, before, you know, sometimes you just rush in and we want to try to get pictures and I'm guilty, just as guilty of this as the next person. Um, but if we just slow down sometimes and pay attention, then we have better opportunities. So hummingbirds, hummingbirds are notoriously difficult to try and photograph. They're fast, they're flighty, they don't sit still for very long. Um, this is a broad-billed hummingbird in Arizona, and one of the things I noticed as we were watching it, there were a number of feeders set up, and this hummingbird came to this particular perch every time before it went to the feeder. And it would come in, and it would sit for a few seconds, and it would check everything out, make sure the feeder was safe, and then it would go to the feeder. So watching that for a few minutes, I was able to sort of pre-focus in this area and be ready when this bird landed that I could snap a shot. 
uh, before it flew away again. And I could get it sharp and in focus and calm, <laughs> which was a challenge for the hummingbird. Um, and likewise, watching for interesting behavior, like the bear trying to scratch his ear, um, those kinds of things are gonna make for some more interesting and more dynamic photographs. So, um, so that having patience and just sort of watching and waiting a little bit to, for that key moment of action um, is also important. Also knowing your subject means having the right gear for your subject. So I said for waterfalls, you might need filters, you might need a tripod, um, sunrises and sunsets, you might need a tripod because you're actually working in very low light conditions as far as your camera is concerned to try to get um, a proper exposure. So you might need a tripod to hold everything steady. So again, having the right gear for your subject is important. Um, this is an example of wildlife photography where that um, depth of field is important um, or and it's a good example of how to get that depth of field that you might want so that shallow depth of field so i'm putting that the, the f-stops that i used up here so the hummingbird was actually an f4 the bear was an f10 you can see on the hummingbird everything back here is blurred it's pleasantly soft you can't even really tell what it is it's trees there was a tree line back there um but it's you know it could just as easily be some kind of plants or grass even you can't really tell um and that's kind of the best way to do wildlife portraits people portraits as well um, to get that nice blurry background. Now, in this case, I probably, for the bear, I probably could have gone to an f-stop that was larger than this. So f4, f5.6, I was doing things on the fly. And this is one of those times when I had two different cameras and I probably wasn't paying close enough attention to my settings. That being said, um, this is a good example where the aperture that you, choo that you choose is going to have a large impact on that depth of field. But the other thing that really impacts it is how close your subject is to the background. So in this hummingbird picture, this hummingbird is perched very far away from that tree line in the back. So it is completely blurred, totally soft. You know, you can't really even tell what it is. The bear, on the other hand, is very close to that grass. So even if I had taken this f-stop to, to f4, f5.6, that grass still wouldn't have been blurred because it's so close to the bear. So keep that in mind um, as you're doing this. It's the, the aperture that you're setting is going to impact that, but also the distance that your subject is from the background is going to have a huge impact on how much you can get that background blurred. The other thing, that third thing, third tip, um, look for a focal point in your image. What, what is my picture about? What am I trying to focus on? Um, so in this case, I made it fairly simple. Um, this is a photograph of a person. This is a birder. This is the hunt for snowy owls at the Jersey Shore in the winter. <laughs> so um, thus the sand and the winter coat and hat um, and the kind of washed out lighting because that's what it looks like in the winter. And, and so, um, you know, my focus is this person. Um, the rest of the scene adds, you know, to that picture, but my focus is really this person. And this is a very simple focal point. This is, you know, the subject of my picture. And we want to make sure that we have a subject. Um, we want to simplify our images so that subject is very apparent. In this case, it's very simple. It's one person on a sandy beach. Um, you know, we want to make sure that the things that need to be in focus are in focus. So for wildlife photography, for example, um, and people photography for that matter, but you want eyes in focus all the time. If the eyes are not in focus, your photograph's not going to look right. Um, and it's hard for a viewer to um, really look at it well when the eyes are out of focus. So you want to make sure those eyes are really in focus. Um, you also want to make sure you give things room to breathe and move. So in this case, the, the birder here is looking into the image. If the person was in the same place, but fit, flipped around and looking towards the right side of the screen here, this image would not work. There's not enough room for them given all the other room on the other side of the image over here. Um, and it's the same 
if I go back to this. Now there's not a ton of room here, but you don't, I don't want the hummingbird image to like end right at the end of the beak. I wanna have a little bit of room for it to breathe. It looks like it could move into that um, part of the, the picture. So uh, we wanna give things room to move and breathe. And I'm gonna go on to a couple sub points here. So some composition helpers, um, because this is really sort of that idea of creating a focal point. What is the subject of my image? What am I trying to convey with this picture? And so sometimes we get stuck. Sometimes it's hard to decide. You're like, I like the scene, but I don't know what I wanna focus on. So there's a couple of things that we can do. One, very simply, is make a frame with your hands and literally look through it with your eyes and look at what's in that frame before you ever look through your camera. And that's gonna just sort of help you see, okay, what is this gonna look like if I make a picture of this? Are things balanced? Are they where they need to be? Um, is anything interesting in this scene? That's first and foremost, a really quick way before you even look through your camera to see, do I have something here? And some of you may already be familiar with this, um, but for those of you who aren't, um, the idea of the rule of thirds, and you don't have to use the word rule, it's not a rule, it's, a, it's an aid, it's a compositional aid, it's a helper, um, excuse me. But the idea is, is that you divide your image into nine segments and you place your objects of interest at the intersections of the lines, so where these blue circles are. Um, again, I'm going to say this is an aid. It's not a rule. Images tend to work when they follow it. So if you're struggling for, you know, you've taken pictures of things that you thought you really liked the way they looked when you were out there seeing them, but when you took the picture and got it home, it just doesn't look right. Try cropping it to this guideline. Um, a lot of software, if you put a crop tool on it, it will superimpose the rule of thirds on there to help you crop and crop to the rule of thirds. Try to line something up along the intersections of these points and see if that makes the image a little bit more interesting or a little bit more dynamic. Um, likewise, when you're in the field, if you have the option to turn on the rule of thirds grid so that you see it in your view screen all the time, I encourage you to do it. Again, sometimes you want to break that rule and it's okay, but a lot of times it's going to help you a lot to figure out what the best composition of that image might be. So if we go back to this image, with um, my birder on the Jersey Shore and I superimpose the rule of thirds grid over this, you can see my person is at the intersection of the grid. Um, their head is pretty close to the top. So that's where a viewer's eye is naturally gonna be drawn to. Um, and the other thing, and we'll talk more about this, but um, where my horizon is, my horizon is not dead set in the middle. Um, and in this case, the texture of the sand was more interesting to me than the sky. So the sand is the bottom two thirds of the image and the sky is the top one third. And I can use these horizontal lines to help me figure out where the horizon should be um, and make sure that I'm not putting it dead set in my image, in the center of my image. Sometimes when you're trying to do a reflection kind of a thing, your horizon may be in the center of your, your um, image but for the most part um, we don't want to divide our pictures in half with our horizon line um, it's going to be much more interesting and dynamic if we place it closer to the top third or the bottom third of the picture a couple other composition helpers that i have here um, for you. So think about um, leading lines, the idea of, so in this case, this is my boardwalk bringing, and this is going to bring a viewer's eye into the image. So it could be a road, it could be a railroad track, it could be a stream. Sometimes it's even the curve of a hill, the way it might curve around in an image. And the idea is it brings your viewer's eye in. It, it shows them where they need to focus um, rather than sort of all over the picture and not having a place to rest. The other way that you can do that is with framing. So in this case, this cabin is framed with these two trees that are all also in the image. So using things that are already there to sort of help frame your subject. Again, it focuses your viewer's eyes on your subjects and brings them into um, the image, gives them a place to settle. 
their eyes a place to settle. And one last um, composition helper, and this is more because I don't know where else to put it. <laughs> this really isn't so much about composition per se, but the idea, if you're doing landscapes and you're doing sort of grand landscapes, consider adding a person or people or an animal for a sense of scale. Um, that, you know, grand landscapes in and of themselves are wonderful, but sometimes it can really help to have people in the image to really show how big something is or how high something is, or like, again, just to give that sense of context. Um, and you don't have to have them in every picture, but consider times when that might be appropriate um, as well. And again, it's just a way of, of thinking about how can I make this image um, a little bit more interesting and meaningful for the people that might be looking at it. Fourth tip, work the light. Um, you probably have all heard the idea of golden hours. So shooting um, 30 minutes before to 30 minutes after sunrise and 30 minutes before to 30 minutes after sunset. Those are the two golden hours at the beginning and the end of the day. Um, we typically want to tend to try to avoid, that's when the light is softest. The sun is low on the horizon, so shadows aren't harsh, um, shadows aren't big. Um, so they don't tend to get in our way when we're trying to set up a shot. Um, we tend to want to avoid, avoid uh, middle of the day, harsh light, midday situations. They're going to give us yeah, really harsh light, really big shadows, um, dark shadows when they exist. So something that we want to stay away from. Now, sometimes you don't have a choice. You're on vacation, you're on a family tour, you're, you know, you still want to get some shots. This is another case where knowing your gear can really help you achieve acceptable images in less than ideal lighting situations. Um, they're not going to be the same as taking sunrise and sunset images, but you can still get better images um, if you're fully aware of the capabilities of the gear that you have with you. Um, so another good reason to understand, um, you know, what apertures you have available to you, um, how your camera of uh, response to bright light um, and there's ways of sort of compensating for those um, types of images because there's sometimes we just don't have a choice we're someplace that we want to take a picture and it's one o'clock in the afternoon and we don't have you know any other options so um, again a good another good uh, point for knowing your gear Shoot wide and shoot closer. Uh, these kind of go hand in hand. The idea of trying to do something a little bit different. So shoot a very wide angle photograph to um, you know, get that really expansive kind of view um, or get really in close like this picture of the bee um, to really highlight the, the small and the you know, up close and personal. Um, some of these kinds of things are going to require specialized gear, uh, wider angle lenses, um, you know, macro lenses, those kinds of things. Um, I will say if you have a DSLR where that you can change lenses for, um, I've done a lot of work where I actually rented lenses for um, various things that I was going vacations or trips that I was taking where I wanted an option, different options than I had. Um, there are a couple, the company that I used was Borrow Lenses. Um, they're online. I never had any problems with you, them depending, the price depends on the lens or the body that you want to rent, but that's another really good way of trying out gear um, if you want to try something a little bit different. Um, you don't always have to have special gear to do some of these kinds of things. Um, you can physically get close. Sometimes we tend to take our pictures, you know, kind of at a fair distance from our subject and you can physically move yourself closer. Um, you can also think about the abstract. Um, and I, I couldn't find my image of this. I actually have an image that I did at the Philadelphia Zoo that is the side of a giraffe. So it's literally just the pattern on the side of a giraffe. 
um, and you know instantly what it is when you look at it, but it's not the whole giraffe. It's just the pattern on the side. And it's cool. It's got cool texture because of the hair and, um, you know, it looks really neat. But so think about like, could I make this an abstract shot? Should, could I, you know, take the telephoto lens that I have and zoom in on something um, and shoot closer that way? So, um, and think about zooming with your feet, as I said, getting in, um, you know, and uh, um, getting in close physically um, can go a long way, especially if you're using a phone, for example. Um, and that goes along with changing your perspective. So we all tend to take a lot of photos from our own eye level. We, we, we're standing up, we're walking down a trail, we pull the camera up to our eyes and we snap a picture. And so all of our pictures come out and phone pictures are the worst for this. Um, because people are standing up and they just take, they, you know, snap a picture from where they're standing. The best tip that I can give you is kneel down, sit down, lay down on the ground on your belly if you can. Um, this image, had I been standing up, I know it still looks like I'm up a little bit on this and I am. There were fire ants in the area, so I was not going to lay down on my belly <laughs> in this case, um, but I was on my knees and I was much closer to this iguana than I would be have been had I been standing up and pointing down. And I would not have gotten a picture that looks like I can see its eye. Um, I would have gotten the top of its head. And so those changing that perspective can really go a long way um, towards getting better photographs. And if we go back to the previous picture, um, this one of the creek, this is actually the creek outside the barn at Four Mills. The other thing about changing the perspective is the camera is on a tripod on the ground. It's not up near me, it's down low. And those are the kinds of things that are going to change the perspective of your image and make them look different than everybody else's because everybody else is standing up and taking it at eye level. Um, so get low. Also get high if you can. Sometimes taking something really from above, excuse me, gives you a really, really cool perspective. So if you have an option to get high as well for certain things, do it. Um, and you may get some really interesting photographs. The other thing is, I'm gonna tell you, this is specific to mobile photography. So if you have a mobile phone, most of the time your lenses are near the top of your phone. Sometimes they're in the middle, depending on the model, but they're still kind of more towards the top. Right. So and we tend to take an image like this. If you want to change your perspective with your iPhone or your Android phone, whatever phone you're using, turn it upside down. What will happen is the screen will rotate. So your scene will still be right side up on your screen, but it will actually put your lens down near the ground. So say I was looking at a mushroom rather than taking a picture of a mushroom like this or like this, if I turn my phone upside down and take a picture of the, the um, mushroom from underneath of it or looking up at it, it makes that mushroom look like it's giant and it highlights things that we don't normally see. So that's a really easy way to change your perspective with your mobile phone is just turn it upside down and put your lens at the bottom and shoot that way. Um, seventh, optimize your depth of field. So we kind of already talked about this, but this is a really key one. Know what you're trying to shoot. Um, do you want a landscape like this where you want everything in focus from the front to the back? I want to see those mountains in the back. Um, or do you want a portrait like the hummingbird where you want everything blurred? I thought I had put a thing on there. This was F22. Um, so I got all the way from the front to the back. Another thing um, that I want to point out here, and this is particularly true for landscape images, you want to have some kind of a foreground in front to anchor your image. Um, this is not a great foreground. This image is not going to win any, you know, National Geographic kind of awards. Um, this is a lake in Alaska. I was there on a tour. I was probably never going back there. So I wanted to capture the scene as best I could. And unfortunately, um, there was a parking lot right out of the, the scene here. So I was very limited in what I had to pick for my foreground and to work with. Um, and sometimes that's the case. So you do the best you can. But still having this foreground 
anchor this image rather than starting my picture in the middle of the lake um, is actually still better. Um, even though it's not a great foreground because it, it does, uh, it lends an anchor to that landscape and again helps draw a viewer's eye past the foreground. So I have layers, I have a foreground, I have a midground of the lake and kind of where these trees come in. And then I have a background of all the way in the back and those mountains way far away. Um, and that's what you want to do when you're setting up a landscape shot like this is to have those sections have a foreground have a midground have a background and figure out for yourself what they are before you take the image because i can guarantee you if you don't you're going to get home and you're going to be like why did i take this picture um or you know it doesn't look right so again Think about those things before you actually snap the shutter, you know, make the frame with your hands and kind of say, okay, how am I going to frame this and where's the best point for me to stand um, to take this picture or to set my tripod down to take this picture. Um, capturing action and movement. So this is where shutter speed becomes much more important than aperture. So when we talk about this, there's a couple of things that we can do. We can set a fast shutter speed so we freeze motion. So in this example, um, the bird was moving because it was flying. The waves were moving. I was moving because I was on a boat. Um, so I needed to make sure that I had a fast enough shutter speed that I got it in focus. I actually could have gone a little bit faster to freeze the wingtips, but I kind of actually like the way this conveys a sort of a sense of motion of the bird flying, so it's okay. And it's eyes in focus. So the fact that its wingtips are blurry isn't such a bad thing. Um, or so we can freeze motion or we can blur motion. So with a waterfall, Rather than just taking a snapshot where we see all the white water, we can actually make it silky and smooth and we can do this to rivers and streams and waterfalls. We can actually do it to clouds and we can do it to grasses that are blowing in the wind. And we can kind of get that sense of wind motion in our photographs by adjusting our shutter speed. So here in the Puffin example, um, I was at one one thousandth of a second um, to get this image sharp. And as I said, I probably could have gone even a little bit faster. Uh, the waterfall image, on the other hand, I was at five seconds um, to try to blur that water. Now, I put this image in here because, again, it's not going to win any National Geographic Awards. But to show you what I talked about when I said you need filters for blurring waterfalls. So, obviously, I can't hold a camera for five seconds. So, this camera was sitting on a tripod so that I could keep the shutter open for five seconds and it wouldn't move. And that's also where having an, a remote shutter uh, control comes into play because I don't want to touch the camera because I don't want it to move. So I have a cord or a wireless um, shutter control and I can turn the shutter open, open the shutter um, without having to press the button and potentially jostle or move the camera as it's starting that exposure. So those are two tools I really need. The other tool I said you need for waterfalls is filters. So this was what happens is when you leave the shutter open for something like five seconds, even two seconds, areas that are really bright in your image are going to get overexposed. So this rock had the sun on it. And even though I had a relatively strong neutral density filter on the front of my camera, it wasn't enough. Um, I probably should have played around a little bit and maybe try two and a half seconds, see if that would have still blurred the water and not overexposed the rock. Um, I actually didn't pay enough attention when I was in the field to the fact that that rock was so overexposed. So two lessons. One is make sure you have the right equipment for the job. Two, check your work in the field before you get home and are disappointed um, because that's you know, something that can happen if you're not paying attention. Um, 
and trial and error. Five seconds, probably too much. Two and a half might have worked just fine. So again, playing around with the settings. There is no hard and fast rule. Um, it's going to depend on the amount of water. It's going to depend on the light of the scene. Um, all of those kinds of things are going to impact the shutter speed that you're going to choose. But these are the kinds of things where you want to um, choose your shutter speed. So, you know, if you're shooting your kid's soccer game, you definitely want to have your shutter speed control set versus your aperture control because you want to capture those kids and the motion um, of them um, much more than you're worried about blurring the background um, in those cases. So this is where um, understanding shutter speed and knowing how to set those um, shutter speeds on your, your camera are going to be really important. Um, da, 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 da. Make sure I got it, my points. Yes. Okay. So, um, almost done. Number nine. Think about horizon and sky. So I touched on this. Is the is the foreground and, or the ground more interesting than the sky, or is the sky more interesting than the ground? And that's going to decide where you put your horizon line. So in this case, the sky was much more interesting than all this sand. So my horizon line is at the bottom third of the image and the vast majority of the image is the sky. Um, in this case, it's more focused on the foreground. Um, I didn't, the sky was completely blown out, to be honest with you, obviously because the sun was right there, um, but I really liked what the, the light was doing to this grass and the detail on the grass and the grass was a little wet and it may be hard to see um, depending on the size of the screen you're looking at right now, um, but it was really cool and so I, you know, Yes, I still have some overexposed sun here, and that's going to happen if you're if you've got the sun in your image. Um, but obviously, I was focused on the foreground here and not the sky. Um, so think about where you want your horizon. Think about how much of the sky to include or not include. And this is also true for bad weather days. Um, if the sky is flat and gray, actually, that's really soft light for doing a lot of photographs of, of plants and, and other things like that, um, and some of the more detailed kinds of things. Maybe, maybe there's interesting mushrooms or um, fungi growing on a tree or something like that. Um, those are the days that you want to do that kind of stuff. The light's soft. There's not a lot of harsh shadows, even at 11 o'clock. But the fact of the matter is the sky is really boring. So make sure you take images that don't have a lot of sky in them um, or don't have any sky in them because that sky is going to do nothing to make your photo look interesting or dynamic when it's sort of that flat gray light outside. Um, so think about that and, and think about um, what the sky looks like and do I want it in my image. And then the last tip that I have for you is learn basic photo editing. So you don't have to become a Lightroom or a Photoshop guru, but as I said in the beginning, if you're going to shoot raw, you have to edit your images. Um, they're going to come out of your camera looking very, very flat. And if you've shot raw and been disappointed in your images and you haven't done any editing, that's why. Because they come out with nothing but the basic information about the photograph. So this image is a raw file that came straight out of my Sony camera. And this is the same image, cropped a little bit added a touch of contrast, a little bit of sharpening, a couple of other basic edits, probably took me 30 seconds. I mean, it wasn't a lot, honestly. Um, maybe a minute, uh, you know, all total at the end of the day. Um, and you can see the level of detail in the cactus, um, the green of the flowers is starting, is much more contrasty and poppy, um, much more interesting. It creates that, that um, tonal contrast that is just not in the raw image. And so if you're shooting raw, you, you have to edit because you need to add those things back. Um, if you're shooting in JPEG, things like contrast and sharpening are already going to be in your image. But again, you want to make sure that you've chosen the proper settings because you can choose um, most point and shoots. You can choose how much sharpening you want them to add, the, the camera to add, or how much um, uh, contrast you want the camera to add. 
you have to do that before you take the shot. So you kind of have to play around and, and play with those settings and see what it looks like, but you can do that. So um, keep that in mind. And even if you're shooting raw images with your phone, you do need to do some basic editing as well because they need that contrast and sharpening to make them pop a little bit and not look quite so flat. So learning basic photo editing will go very far um, in um, making your photography look better. Couple last slides before I break for questions. Um, I said I would talk about mobile photography specifically. So I've already thrown in a bunch of tips um, specific to using phones, but I will say um, one thing, particularly if you're using an iPhone, a lot of Android phones already do this, I think. Um, from some of the people that I work with, I've been able to figure out it looks like a lot of them do this, but um, Apple phones do not do this. Purchase an app that allows you a level of manual control. So Camera Plus is one, Pro Camera is another one. Um, they're both really good apps that allow you to separate your focus area and your exposure area. So this over here on the very right is a screenshot um, from my iPhone. And this is actually in an app, um, uh, the Moment app from um, Moment company who makes these lenses and you can see these two circles here this is literally a picture of my desk um, or the camera is focused on my desk but you see this top circle has this little sun symbol in it and this bottom circle has sort of a bunch of like a crosshatch grid of lines the top circle is where the app is going to take the exposure of the picture from and the bottom one is where it's going to focus and iPhone, the native camera app, doesn't allow you to do this. Exposure and focus point are always exactly the same. They've added that little toggle bar on the side with the sun where you can increase or decrease the overall exposure, but you can't separate the two points. So where this can come in really handy is if I have a really bright sky and I want to make sure I don't overexpose the sky, I can tell it to take my exposure from the sky and then I can focus on the flower that I'm taking a picture of. Um, it's always easier to lighten up a dark picture than it is to darken an overexposed picture. Just keep that in mind. Once you blow out the whites in your picture, it's really hard to recover them, especially on a phone. Um, it can be hard even with a DSLR camera, but it's really hard on a phone. So it's always better to, you know, expose for the brightest area of your image, even if your subject is a little underexposed, because you can always lighten that in editing. Um, as I said, you can shoot raw with most phones now. Um, so consider that as another way of getting more data um, to work with and being able to properly expose your image and, and play with it a little bit more in post-processing. It just gives you much more to work with. Um, again, to shoot, to shoot raw in an Apple product, you actually have to have an app like Camera Plus or Pro Camera or the Moment Camera app that shoots that. I don't understand why the native app doesn't do that, but it does. Um, Android's a little bit different, but again, most of them you can shoot raw with. Cameras, it's really, really important to zoom with your feet, not the camera. Um, you, Yes, you can pinch in on your screen and zoom, but that's a digital zoom. It's not an optical zoom like we think of a zoom lens. And so it makes your picture really grainy it actually decreases the file size of your picture because you just you've cut out so much of that scene. Um, so if you need to get closer, zoom with your feet. And if you need to crop, you're better off taking the picture from further away and cropping after the fact than you are of zooming in, um, pinching and zooming on your screen. Um, it just will give you a better quality image if you actually crop um, after the fact. Think about using accessory lenses. Uh, Moment is the ones I use. These are really good glass um, lenses. They have a dedicated case that I keep on my phone all the time and the lenses just screw onto the, the case um, so I can use them um, whenever I choose. Um, they have a variety of them. They have a macro lens, which is my new favorite lens. They have uh, very wide angle lenses. Um, they have a telephoto lens. Excuse me. Um, and they um, 
the another company is Oliclip. I haven't used them as much. I know a lot of people that have and they like them. They just sort of slide over um, your camera. Depending on the case that you have, they may or may not work. So something you need to be aware of. And then edit, just like with DSLR point and shoot photography, you want to think about editing. Um, this icon down here with the leaf is an app called Snapseed. It's free. It's a really good photo editor. Highly encourage you to take a look at it. Um, Lightroom has an app that's free that you can use most of the editing, the free version. Um, if you are actually a Lightroom user, to edit your DSLR point and shoot photography, you can actually sync your accounts um, and you know use it. You can get your mobile photography to match up to your catalog um, on your desktop and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, but they do a free version, and again, it's a it's a very powerful photo editor um, on its own. So, you know, either one of these, um, I use Snapseed all the time on my mobile photography, and I really like it. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, okay, so mobile photography. These are a bunch of pictures from my presentation. All of these pictures were taken with my phone. Um, they were a bunch of different models. I don't even remember which one at this point, um, and I didn't go back and check, but some were accessory lenses. So like this top one up here, this is a moment super wide angle lens. Um, the B is actually a moment macro lens on my phone. Um, some of these others might have been wide angles, but a lot of them were just straight out of the camera. This little bug here is a macro lens. So, um, one thing that you might notice is that um, a lot of my landscape images tend to be for my phone. And there's two reasons for, for this. One is because my main camera is often set up for wildlife photography and particularly birds. And in the heat of the moment, I'm really, really bad at remembering to change the settings. So I end up with landscapes that lack that deep depth of field because I've got a really wide depth of field or big big aperture set for doing bird photography and trying to blur that background and then I get home and I hate my landscape photographs. Um, so what I've done is learned that the um, the mobile phone works really well <laughs> for landscapes and oddly enough um, iPhones have a very what we think of as a wide aperture it's f 1.8 which you would think would be really bad for landscapes based on everything that I've told you tonight. But in reality, as you can see, it actually works really well and you get really deep depth of field and sort of everything in focus from front to back. And the reason why that is, is, is because of the physics of the sensor size of the phone. The sensors and phones are really small compared to even basic point and shoot cameras and certainly very, very small compared to DSLR sensor sizes. And so the physics of that, and we're not gonna go any more than that, it's just the physics of that small sensor size, the fixed focal length of your phone, and the set aperture actually makes it very difficult to get blurred backgrounds on your phone. If you've ever tried to do that, you know it's hard. If you use Apple products, you know they added that portrait mode to it. And that's actually a digital mechanism for blurring the background. Um, it's not the same as changing your aperture because in the phone you can't. And so um, this becomes my landscape lens because it gives me that deep depth of field. Um, and then if I snap on a, a, a wide angle lens, I can, you know, make it even a wider scene than I can capture with my Sony camera um, because the, the field of view is so much wider. So um, I encourage you to think about using your phone in that way. Um, it's a really good fallback um, to have and a way to um, get creative excuse me, um, while you're out there, and especially if you're trying to focus on, you know, taking pictures of birds or other things like that, or doing macro photography um, of flowers with your DSLR, and, and you don't want to, you know, undo all your settings, your macro settings to do a, a really wide angle landscape. Um, your phone actually may be a really good, good thing to use. So um, I encourage you to get creative. Um, you do not have to have, as I said, you know, Think about the gear you have and how can you use that um, to its fullest advantage. 
So I'm going to wrap up here with some sort of typical settings. And these are sort of places that you might want to start for these kinds of things. Um, again, a lot of it's going to depend on the, the camera that you have ultimately, but it's going to depend on the scene in front of you, the light that you're working with, excuse me, the, um, uh, you know, the, the what you're trying to capture, basically. So for landscapes, we're talking, we talked about being in aperture priority mode, um, typically F11 or higher. Um, so F16, F22, almost always, you know, you wanna try to get the lowest ISO on the camera. And generally wide or ultra wide kinds of lenses are gonna give you that big expansive kind of landscape feel. Um, waterfalls, you're going to be, want to be on shutter speed priority, anywhere from a half of a second to one twenty of a second to even longer. You saw five seconds in my example, and it really depends on the light, the water, how much water is coming over the falls, which you're trying to capture. Um, and as I said, you may need to play around with that a little bit. You probably need a tripod, you probably need filters to try to capture that. Um, it also brings me back to why I don't have any other waterfall pictures than that one, um, because I am perpetually in the field without the right equipment. Um, I'm not carrying around a tripod most of the time. I don't carry around filters most of the time. Um, and so subsequently, I don't have pictures of blurred waterfalls except for that one. Um, and that's why, because I just, I don't want to carry that equipment around with me. Um, so it's a trade-off that I make. Um, wildlife portraits, um, aperture priority mode again, um, f5.6 or lower, so you want to have as wide open as you can, try to get that blurry background. Um, this is a case where you can kind of let your ISO adjust automatically for creating an adequate shutter speed that you can hand hold. And, um, there's a couple of ways that you can do that. And this is, again, where understanding some of those settings on your camera is going to be really important. And everybody's camera is really different. So it's hard for me to say, go do this. Um, but like on my Sony camera, for example, I can have it set up so that um, I have a maximum shutter speed. So if I'm out doing wildlife photography, I can make sure that my shutter speed will never fall below a certain level. And that means that I'm not gonna have any motion from me um, in the pictures. And if the shutter speed has to go below that for some reason, then I, that, by using that setting, it forces the camera to bump the ISO up. And so, like I said, sometimes I'm going to, you know, you might have grain in your picture, but it means I'm going to have an adequately focused picture. It just might be a little grainy because I use a higher ISO. So look in their, your manuals and online for those kinds of settings. Can you set, you know, a maximum ISO that the camera won't go above to reduce grain? Can you set um, a minimum shutter speed or a maximum shutter speed in some cases so you can um, avoid blur. So again, those are settings that you might have available to you. Um, wildlife portraits are typically talking about some kind of telephoto lens, although um, think about shooting wide, get, you know, the, the elephant in the grand savanna kind of picture. Um, and those are just as meaningful as the up close and in your face kind of pictures. Um, and then wildlife action kinds of things, um, you know, running animals, flying birds. Um, typically, you are going to want to try to switch to shutter speed priority at that point, looking at, you know, one five hundredth of a second or faster. And whatever the fastest focus mode or focus tracking um, engagements that you can set on your camera, you typically want that engaged so that it will focus quickly um, and find that moving. Um, animal and say, uh, focus on it as you move your camera um, with it. And then some other things just to keep in mind, always, um, what's your focal point? Um, you know, eyes in focus, have a straight horizon, um, include a foreground in your landscape images so that you have, you know, an anchor um, to that. And then think about where the sky belongs uh, in terms of interest level or um, you know, is it gray and gross and flat and I don't really want to do my picture at all. And so um, all of those things are going to improve your nature photography. 
So I'm gonna stop here and I'm gonna go up and look at questions. But before I do that really quickly, I wanna talk. So um, every two years we have a photo contest. This is in partnership with um, Friends of the Wissahickon. And so you can submit up to four images. Um, the deadline is October 9th of this year. You can submit your images online. And the images all need to be taken within the Wissahickon Valley Park or along the Green Ribbon Trail or on one of Wissahickon Trail's managed preserves. So if you're not familiar with those properties, you can go on to our website and there's an interactive map and you can see all of that. Um, Friends of Wissahickon also has an interactive map for the lower half of Wissahickon in Philadelphia. Um, and, and I encourage you to get out there and challenge yourself. Uh, get your camera off of auto mode and think about the composition and um, really challenge yourself to get out there and try to take some new images and submit one to the photo contest. Who knows, you might win. Um, and then you can see there are some upcoming events that you might be interested in. Um, next week I'm doing a presentation on iNaturalist and how to use it as an app to help you um, identify wildlife in the field. And then I'm doing a program on monarch migration and tagging. And into October, uh, covering all about salamanders. So everything you ever wanted to know about salamanders. And then later in the fall, I'm doing some presentations on vernal pools, setting up backyard bird feeding stations and um, owls, which are always a favorite topic. So um, keep that in mind. And I'm gonna see if there's any questions now and we can answer them and please feel free. If you've got any questions now, you can uh, type them in. Um, and, uh, I'm not really seeing any questions. Um, I will say um, the, uh, so somebody asked me where the puffin was taken. That was actually taken in, um, in Maine. Um, Eastern Egg Rock is the closest, um, actually it's the only nesting island of puffins in um, the United States. So it's off the coast of Maine. Um, you can get there if you go to uh, Booth Bay Harbor at all to visit Maine. Um, there's whale and puffin watches from Booth Bay Harbor and they take you out to Eastern Egg Rock and you can see the puffins. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's really cool. Highly recommend it if you get the chance. Um, so I will say um, one of the things that I was going to tell people and I kind of forgot. So I tried to cover like a lot of the surface stuff on here because I don't know everybody's background. First of all, please feel free to reach out to me with questions if you have them, if they come up as you, you know, think about stuff or you're trying to do something afterwards and you're like, I just don't get this. Please feel free to reach out and ask questions um, after the fact, I'm happy to answer them. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is if there are um, specific areas of nature photography or specific learnings about sort of photography in general that you are interested in having a program on, I'm making no promises, um, but feel free to email me, drop me an email and let me know what those things are. Um, as I said, I try to keep this sort of very high level, sort of beginner level, um, but if there's deeper dives on stuff that you want, um, please let me know. Um, you know, we're looking at calendar programming for into the beginning of next year. And uh, you know, if we have to be virtual or even in person, there may be other things that I can do. So um, please feel free to reach out with other topics around photography that you might be interested in. Um, as I said, no promises, but I'm happy to uh, um, take a look and see what we can do. So Oh, somebody asked, what's the best lens for trying to get flying birds? Is it a telephoto lens? So it actually kind of depends on how far away the birds are from you. Um, so in birds with any kind of a distance, yes, you kind of want a telephoto. Um, I didn't really go into this, but the problem with telephoto lenses is that they significantly reduce your field of view. So where with a wide angle lens, you're say looking at, you know, all the way across the stream there in that picture, right? You can see all the trees on either side, you know, it's, it's a very wide angle. If you were looking at that through a telephoto lens, you'd only see a small section of the middle of the stream far away from you. 
And so it can actually be really hard to find flying birds with a telephoto lens. Um, and I know that sounds funny because yes, a telephoto is the best thing to take a picture with, but I encourage you to try with um, a little bit wider of a lens. And again, for this to work, the birds have to be kind of close to you, but you know, you could go to some place like a pond, a local pond or something that might have ducks or geese or something like that um, and practice with a wider angle and then whatever of the maximum telephoto that you have zooming in because you'll see as you do that it's really hard to find the bird in the telephoto lens um, without a lot of practice so that's really i all the questions that i see right now so again um, please feel free to reach out after the fact um, and i hope that you all got something out of this um, and got some tips that you can take away to your own photography. And I really, really encourage you um, to uh, submit a, a photo to the photo contest. So thank you everybody. And I hope you all have a really good rest of your evening and hopefully we um, see you at a, an upcoming presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Christy.